not all client devices are created equal, especially not in terms of their Wi-Fi radios. If you look at a high-end laptop, for example, it will normally have a Wi-Fi chip that is capable of 3x3 free free through 3 MIMO. So it has 3 RX chains, 3 TX chains, and it can do free spatial streams at the same time. The smartphones will usually have 1x1 one one through 1, so 1 TX chain, 1 RX chain, 1 spatial stream, or at maximum, 2x2 two two through 2, 2x, two, uh, 2 RX chains, 2 TX chains, and 2 spatial streams. Now, the reason why we want mobile devices to have a lower number of radio chains is battery life. The more radio chains you introduce, the harder the drain is on your battery and on your smartphones, on any devices that are mobile, that are not constantly attached to a, a power source, you don't want a high battery drain. So that's the reason why we're talking about 1x1 one one or 2x2 two two devices. And one of the things that becomes apparent uh, when you deploy Extreme Cloud IQ and you look at the client population is you will see that we mostly live in a 2x2 two two world. Most of the devices on our networks are actually 2x2 two two for 2. Some of them might be 3x3, three three, like more powerful laptops, but the majority of the devices are going to be 1x1 one one or 2x2, two two, which immediately tells you something about the access points and the access point configuration that you will need to select for your network. So what does that mean? Well, here's an example of how different client devices with different radios translate to maximum data rates. Let's take a 802.11ac 3 by 3 for free laptop and that laptop on a 20 megahertz channel will be able to negotiate a data rate of 260 megabits per second. That will be the maximum data rate that a client device can use for communication with the access point. The 1x1 one one for 1 802.11n client will be able to negotiate maximum of 65 megabits per second across a 20 megahertz channel. So you can immediately see that in that same network, those two devices will have a vastly different data rate. And if your network is a network of 3x3 three three through 3 access points and all of your devices are 1x1 one one through 1, well, your capacity of that single AP is going to be 65 megabits per second because that's all that those client devices are able to use. When you have a mix of devices, say you have a mix of 1x1 one one through 1 and 3x3 three three through 3 devices, the your airtime will look more complex with some devices using 260 megabits per second, speeding up your network, and then when the eight one by one through one devices kick in, your capacity will shrink and expand again and shrink again and expand again. Um, but this goes to show that the client population is also the one driving the capacity. It's not just deploying the latest and greatest and the best in-class access points, it's also about the client population and the access point and the client work together to achieve higher capacity and higher performance. So determining the capacity of your network will depend not only on the access points that you deploy. So if you deploy a 4x4 four four through 4 and you only have 1x1 one one through 1 devices, your capacity is capped at 65 megabits per second on a 20 megahertz channel. Um, you will need to look into your client database to determine what's actually going on and how you can best leverage that access point configuration to maybe do other things. So if you have a 3x3 free free, free free access point, you have one free radio chain uh, or two free radio chains, uh, you can do something else with that radio chain. For example, you can scan for DFS events. And again, you cannot make these decisions until you know what your client population is and what your clients are actually doing on the network. When we talk about capacity, one of the important things we need to look at is airtime consumption. If we take a step back and we look at Wi-Fi as type of communication, usually Wi-Fi is considered as a half-duplex medium. So one station talks, the others listen. This is made a little bit more complex with the introduction of 802.11ax. However, 802.11ax is still in no means a full duplex form of communication 
the way a switch is. Um, 802.11ax still has a contention period, but within that contention period, once an access point has won the contention of the channel and can transmit, that contention period can then be split into multiple resource units, and within that contention period, the AP can communicate with multiple clients at the same time. But outside of that, we still have channel contention. And it still means devices take turns when they communicate. They cannot communicate whenever they want. That brings us to airtime consumption. Because we have devices with different capabilities, because we have devices with different radios, different amount of radio chains, different capabilities in terms of data rates, um, the, they will consume the airtime available differently. So, for example, if you have 5,000 bytes of data to send using a 3x3 free free for free high-end laptop, that laptop will be sending that amount of data using a 260 megabits per second data rate. So it will be able to send that data quicker than a one by one for one client that's only capable of 65 megabits per second. And if, if they both have the same amount of data to send, the lower capable client will need a longer period of time and will sit on the channel for a longer period of time than the more capable client which basically means low-end devices or devices with lower capabilities will block your network or will, will block other devices from accessing the channel until they're finished. And if those devices have a lot of data to send, well, then they can be slowing down your network. In the past, we've talked about 802.11b clients, for example, or legacy clients. And if you think about a low capable client or client with low radio capabilities sitting at the edge of your network compounds the problem further because the negotiated data rate was 65 megabits per second or that was the maximum data rate that that device could use and it moved away from the access point to the very edge of the network and that data rate maybe now is one megabit per second if that's what's supported and it will it will then send 5,000 bytes with a data rate of one megabit per second basically stopping everybody else from communicating for that period of time. So those kind of devices further slow down your network. And this is the effect of have duplex medium, and this is how airtime consumption works. Now, what you want is your devices to have as high a data rate as possible to consume airtime for as short period as possible, uh, and to go off channel and allow other devices to communicate as quickly, as quickly as you can. And you can only achieve that by allowing higher and higher data rates and more, more complex MCS uh, coding schemes. Let's go back to layer one, to physical aspects of Wi-Fi deployment. The number one thing about RF or RF communication or any radio communication is the electromagnetic waves don't just stop where you draw a circle. The electromagnetic waves actually travel on for quite an extensive range uh, until they eventually ring out. And that's why a Wi-Fi signal doesn't simply stop when it goes to a certain level or when it hits a certain uh, barrier. And the negative effect of RF spreading around and multiple uh, devices communicating on the same channel is called co-channel interference or sometimes referred to as co-channel contention. Because Wi-Fi is a half duplex medium and if we have two devices using channel one, like on the slide, only one of those two access points will be able to communicate at any point in time. So it's either one or the other. This problem gets compounded when you add clients to it, because then client stations also contend for the medium. So it's either one of those two access points or one of the client devices connected to the access point that will be able to communicate at any point in time. And this amount of time when others have to wait for one of the stations to finish their transmission is called co-channel interference or co-channel contention. The more devices you have on the same channel, the bigger the problem, the bigger the co-channel interference. And the, you, the way we usually solve co-channel interference is by 
using non-overlapping channels. However, on the 2.4 frequency spectrum, we only have three or four non-overlapping channels. Now, why do I say three or four? Uh, it's three channels when you're using 22 megahertz channel spacing uh, using the DSSS uh, modulation scheme and 20 megahertz channels, uh, wide channels when you're using OFDM. Now, the reason why we don't use four channel schemes everywhere in the world, which would be ideal in the OFDM world, is because our neighbors may not be using the uh, four channel scheme. And if our neighbor is using a three channel scheme and we're using a four channel scheme, it creates an adjacent interference, adjacent channel interference scenario where, for example, we are using channel one um, and our neighbor is using channel five, which creates interference. So in that case, what we need to do is we need to fall back to a free channel scenario uh, to assume that everybody's using 1, 6, and 11, even though in theory we could all be using 1, 5, 9, and 13. So preventing CCI means using non-overlapping channels. And we, there's more non-overlapping channels available on the 5 gigahertz frequency band than they are on the 2.4 frequency band. And that's why to mitigate CCI or co-channel interference, we normally drive for a 5 gigahertz based deployment.